Hi guys, welcome to my video on stress and brittle faulting in Earth's crust. This picture shows a fault scarp. This is where a fracture in Earth's crust came up and intersected the surface and slip along that shear fracture actually dropped this block in the foreground down relative to this block in the background. So this is an extensional fault scarp. It's almost two meters high. And what we want to do in this video is think a little bit about how stresses in Earth's crust cause Earth's crust to break and how different configurations of stress cause different configurations of faulting in Earth's crust. And I want to motivate this with an example from the Basin and Range province in Nevada. So the Basin and Range is an area located between Reno, Nevada and Salt Lake City, Utah, essentially between the Sierra Nevada mountains and the Rockies. And all these north-south ridge lines are actually large mountain ranges, and they're separated by deep basins filled with sediment. And notice they're all running north-south. The origin of these basins and ranges is actually a series of extensional normal faults. Each of these mountain ranges, as shown in this blow-up, is essentially flanked by an extensional normal fault that's dropped the basin downward and allowed the mountain range to pop up on the hanging wall. So all of these extensional normal faults are happening in response to some kind of east-west extension, or they're accommodating east-west extension. And in this video, we want to understand what is the stress regime that's causing this east-west extension? Where did it come from, and what does it look like? So we'll start out this video by talking a little bit about the basics of how the state of stress is described in Earth's crust. And then we'll finish the video by looking at how that state of stress can control the style of brittle faulting and shear fracturing. So first, what is stress? Stress is force per unit area. Okay, this guy's going to hit the wedge with some force. Okay, and that force in this example is going to be concentrated on the tip of this wedge, which is going to give a really high stress. So stress is force per unit area. You can make stress higher by simply reducing the area over which it's applied. So how do we define the state of stress in the lithosphere? It's a bit different than at the surface. The first thing to know about stresses in the lithosphere is that they're always compressional. And this is because rock is always sitting below the surface, so it always has an overburden weighing down on it. And this creates what's called an environment of triaxial compression. And the stress state within triaxial compression can be described by three principal stress vectors, sigma 1, 2, and 3. By definition, these stress vectors are all orthogonal to each other. So they're at 90 degrees in three-dimensional space, and they have different lengths corresponding to the magnitude of their different stresses. Now importantly, sigma 1 is always defined as the maximum stress, and sigma 3 is always defined as the minimum stress. So they don't correspond to fixed orienta orientations in space, they just correspond to, to the relative magnitudes. Sigma 1 is biggest, sigma 3 is smallest. So in this representation, you can see they're all forcing inward on some arbitrary point in Earth's lithosphere. Sigma 1 is the biggest, sigma 3 is the smallest force, and sigma 2 is the intermediate. But it's always compressional. Now, stresses inside of Earth's lithosphere really arise from two different sources. One is lithostatic stress. This arises from the weight of the overburdened rocks. All right, so keep in mind, we're always talking about stresses on some parcel of rock in Earth's interior. And because this rock is buried beneath a lot of overlying rock, 
it feels pressure from that overlying rock. And as long as that pressure is counteracted by the neighboring parcels, then we end up with equal and opposite uh, stresses in all of our three principal directions. So mathematically, the sigma 1 stress equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. That's the definition of lithostatic stress. However, it's important to remember that these all get bigger with depth. They're equal, but they actually get bigger as you go down deeper and you get more overburden. And if you want to know the magnitude of that lithostatic stress, it's pretty easy to compute. It's just given by the density of the overlying rock times gravitational acceleration times the height of that overlying rock or the, the depth of burial. And that comes out uh, essentially in units of pascals. All right, so that's one, the lithostatic stress. The second source of stress in Earth lithosphere is tectonic stresses. These come from the motion of tectonic plates, okay? So imagine now we're gonna collide two tectonic plates together. That's gonna exert a, com a horizontal compressional stress, okay? On top of whatever lithostatic stress this parcel of rock was already feeling. So what this means is this takes us away from a purely lithostatic situation and it gives rise to what's called a differential stress. And the differential stress is given by the difference between the sigma one, the biggest, and the sigma three, the smallest. So you're essentially asking here, okay, how different are the maximum stress and the minimum stress from each other? And it turns out that as the maximum stress gets bigger and bigger relative to the minimum stress, the likelihood of failure gets higher and higher. And when differential stress gets big enough, we're gonna eventually exceed what's called the yield strength of the material. And that will be discussed in detail in the follow-up video coming next. All right, so tectonic stress and lithostatic stress combine to give us differential stress. Now, how does that stress state that we just described control the style of brittle faulting in the lithosphere. Now here's where things get a little complicated. So first you have to imagine that the lithosphere is going to break along some planar surface and we're going to call that a planar shear fracture or a fault. And the key thing is that that fault, that plane, can be oriented in any direction, right? If we have a a homogeneous medium and we want to break it, it doesn't matter how we break it, we could break it along any number of possible breakage planes. And which of those planes is going to break? Well that's determined by the state of stress. And specifically the way this works is that our state of stress given by sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 can actually be always decomposed into a normal and a shear stress relative to some given hypothetical plane, all right? So we have a 3D stress and we can decompose it into a normal stress that's perpendicular to a plane and a shear stress that is parallel to a plane, okay? Now, this plane is imaginary. So if we picked a different plane, we'd have a completely different magnitude of normal versus shear stress for that imaginary plane within our actual stress field, okay? So, here's the other thing. As differential stress gets bigger, so as sigma one gets a lot bigger than sigma three, regardless of how those are oriented, um, the, the bigger the difference between them gets, the, the more likely it is, or, or by definition, there is now a plane, an imaginary plane that exists that's going to have a very high shear stress relative to a very high normal stress. And that's the plane that's likely to break as a shear fracture. All right, so let's look at that again. Here is a situation, we've got a block of lithosphere and here's our state of stress. We got sigma one at 100, sigma two at 50, and sigma three at 30 megapascals, all right?
And here's an, an example of six possible fault planes that could rupture within this state of stress. And it turns out in this case, the most likely plane to rupture is plane three, okay? It's 60 degrees from vertical right here, and it's gonna rupture essentially as an extensional normal fault where this side would drop down, the left side would drop down relative to the right side, much like faults in the basin and range. And the reason that that is the most likely plane to rupture is because that's the plane on which these principal stresses deconvolve to give us the highest shear stress relative to normal stress along that plane. And it's not surprising, right? Our main principal stress is vertical, so we know a lot of our stress is coming in this direction. So the plane is kind of sub-parallel to that largest stress direction. So now we'll take this one step further. It turns out that depending on the orientation of sigma 1, 2, and 3, different orientations in space of those biggest and smallest stresses actually predict specific types of faults in specific geometries. And let's take a look at these. So consider extensional faulting first, the one we've already been working on. Extensional faulting is favored when you have your, your largest sigma 1 stress in the vertical and you have your weakest sigma three stress in the horizontal. Essentially what's happening here is you've got your major stress pushing down and you have a very weak stress confining it on the side. So but kind of as a result, the block is able to expand out laterally in a sense to get away from this downward stress. And in terms of what we've been talking about, we're going to rupture a fault plane here, an extensional fault plane, that is not too far different from the sigma 1 direction because the maximum shear stress is resolved onto that particular orientation of a plane. All right, so now let's look at thrust faulting. Thrust faulting arises when sigma 1, the maximum, is now horizontal, and sigma 3, the minimum, is now vertical. So we've essentially switched sigma 1 and sigma 3. Okay, so in this case, we're pushing a big stress from the side, and we have relatively little downward stress. That allows this block to essentially pop up and ramp upwards, escaping kind of in an upward direction. Likewise, we see that the, the favored plane here of failure is only about 30 degrees off from that sigma one direction. And then finally, strike slip faulting. Now we're gonna bring sigma one the biggest and sigma three the smallest, both into the horizontal, okay? So essentially we're gonna push laterally in this direction and blocks are gonna escape out against this weak stress. Um, and again, the fault planes are gonna form roughly 30 degrees off of that sigma one direction. So here's 30. 30 and 30. So the, the incipient fault plane with the highest shear stress and the lowest normal stress is often roughly 30 degrees off from the sigma one direction. So let's wrap this video up by coming back to the basin and range of Nevada. Okay, we've got all these extensional normal faults that are accommodating east-west stretching across the basin and range, okay? Well, you now know that if these are really normal faults, you know what the stress regime is here. The state of stress must be what we've talked about. The maximum sigma one stress must be vertical, and the minimum sigma three stress must be horizontal. Specifically in this case, sigma three must be oriented roughly east-west in the direction of extension, okay? So how can we get sigma one in the vertical and sigma three, the weakest, in the horizontal? Well, there's two possible options for this, how we could get this stress state and how we could explain the basin and range.
One way to do it is essentially to build up a very, very thick crustal plateau, something like the Altiplano Plateau in the central Andes. This is about four or 5,000 meters high, and it's flanked on both sides by relatively steep topography. So you can imagine in a case like this, the weight and the pressure from this thick crust creates a huge vertical sigma 1 that is not matched by a, a sigma 3 at the edges. There's really nothing confining these edges. So you have a weak lateral sigma 3. And in this case, you can have what's called gravitational collapse. Essentially, you can get extensional faulting just by having a really big sigma 1 stress due to over thickened crust. So a lot of people think this might be what Nevada looked like 20 million years ago. A thick plateau with a high vertical sigma 1 stress that then collapsed via extensional normal faulting uh, and spread out into what it is today. So that's one option. Another way you can get a vertical sigma 1 and a horizontal sigma 3 is not by making sigma 1 really big, but actually by making sigma 3 really, really small. And one way to make sigma 3 small, right, is keep in mind, this is what sigma 3 looks like. If you want to make that smaller, you can actually pull this block in the other direction. And that's going to counteract sigma 3 and make it smaller. So essentially, the other option here is that there's some kind of actually pulling going on. Perhaps the Sierra Nevada block is essentially pulling away from the Rocky Mountains, which is counteracting that lateral sigma 3, creating a very weak lateral sigma 3, um, and allowing for extensional faulting in the basin and range. So a couple of competing models there, but either way, we've shown how we can use these fault geometries to understand the state of stress and think about the tectonics, or vice versa. So in summary, we've shown that the state of stress is defined by three orthogonal vectors, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. And these are always compressional stresses within the lithosphere. These three principal stresses can be resolved into a shear and a normal stress on any imaginary plane of any imaginary orientation. And as differential stresses get really, really big, okay, the difference between shear and normal stress can also become large on planes of a certain orientation. And that really starts to, to promote tectonic failure. And failure is going to occur on planar orientations that have the highest ratio of shear to normal. And we showed that those planar orientations tend to be roughly 30 degrees from the sigma 1 direction. And so, depending on the orientation of sigma 1 and sigma 3, um, we can get different types of faulting. Normal faulting, thrust faulting, and strike slip faulting. Thanks a lot for listening. I'm going to leave you with this concept question, and we'll work more on this in class.